Section 32 The French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Hilaire Belloc. Section 32. Chapter 6 continued. The Revolution and the Catholic Church. Now, if that first form of reply be given to the question we have posed, though it is sufficient for the type of philosophy which uses it, though it is certainly explanatory of all human quarrels, and though it in particular satisfies a particular modern school of thought, it is evident that history, properly so called, cannot deal with it. You may say that the revolution was the expression of a spirit far more real than any theory that this spirit is no more susceptible of analysis or definition than is the personality of a single human character, and that this reality was in conflict with another reality, to wit, the Catholic Church. You may even, as some minds, by no means negligible have done, pass to the field of mysticism in the matter, and assert that really personal forces, wills superior and external to man, demons and angels, drove the revolution against the Catholic Church, and created the Republic to be an anti-Catholic force, capable of meeting and of defeating that Church, which, by its own definition of itself, is not a theory, but the expression of a personality and a will. To put it in old-fashioned terms, you may say that the revolution was the work of Antichrist. But with that kind of reply, I repeat, history cannot deal. If it be true that, in spite of an absence of contradictory intellectual theories, there is a fundamental spiritual contradiction between the Revolution and the Catholic Church, then time will test the business. We shall see in the case a perpetual extension of the quarrel until the Revolution becomes principally a force for the extinction of Catholicism, and the Catholic Church appears to the supporter of the Revolution not as his principal but as his only enemy. Such a development has not arisen in a hundred years. A process of time far more lengthy will alone permit us to judge whether the supposed duello is a real matter or a phantasm. The second type of answer, the answer which pretends to explain the antagonism by a definite series of events, does concern the historian. Proceeding upon the lines of that second answer, he can bring his science to bear and use the instruments of his trade and he can show, as I propose to show in what follows, how, although no quarrel can be found between the theory of the revolution and that of the church, an active quarrel did in fact spring up between the revolution in action and the authorities of Catholicism, a quarrel which a hundred years has not appeased but accentuated. Behind the revolutionary quarrel lay the condition of the church in the French state since the settlement of the quarrel of the Reformation. With what that quarrel of the Reformation was, the reader is sufficiently familiar. For, roughly speaking, a hundred years, from the first years of the sixteenth century to the first years of the seventeenth, from the youth of Henry the Eighth to the boyhood of Charles I in England, a great attempt was made to change, as one party would have said, to amend, as the other would have said to denaturalize the whole body of western christendom a general movement of attack upon the inherited form of the church and a general resistance to that attack was at work throughout european civilization and either antagonist hoped for a universal success the one of what he called the reformation of religion the other of what he called the divine institution and visible unity of the Catholic Church. At the end of such a period it became apparent that no such general result had been or could be obtained. All that part of the West which had rejected the authority of the See of Rome began to appear as a separate territorial region, permanently divided from the rest. All that part of Europe which had retained the authority of the See of Rome began to appear as another region of territory. The line of cleavage between the two was beginning to define itself as a geographical line, and nearly corresponded to the line which centuries before had divided the Roman and civilized world from the barbarians. The province of Britain 
had an exceptional fate. Though Roman in origin, and of the ancient civilization in its foundation, it fell upon the non-Roman side of the new boundary, while Ireland, which the Roman Empire had never organized or instructed, remained alone with the external parts of Europe in communion with Rome. Italy, Spain, and in the main southern or Romanized Germany, refused ultimately to abandon their tradition of civilization and of religion. But in Gaul it was otherwise, and the action of Gaul during the Reformation must be seized if its modern religious quarrels are to be apprehended. A very considerable portion of the French landed and mercantile classes, that is, of the wealthy men of the country, were in sympathy with the new religious doctrines and the new social organization, which had now taken root in England, Scotland, Holland, northern Germany, and Scandinavia, and which were destined in those countries to lead to the domination of wealth. These French squires and traders were called the Huguenots. The succeeding hundred years, from 1615 to 1715, let us say, were a settlement, not without bloodshed, of the unsatisfied quarrel of the preceding century. All Englishmen know what happened in England, how the last vestiges of Catholicism were crushed out, and all the social and political consequences of Protestantism established in the state. There was even in that same seventeenth century a separate but futile attempt to destroy Catholicism in Ireland. In Germany, a struggle of the utmost violence had only led to a similar regional result. The first third of that hundred years concluded in the Peace of Westphalia, and left the Protestant and Catholic territorial divisions much what we now know them. In France, however, the peculiar phenomena remained of a body powerful in numbers and, what was far more important, in wealth and social power, scattered throughout the territory of the kingdom, organized and by this time fixedly anti-Catholic and therefore anti-national. The nation had recovered its traditional line, and had insisted upon the victory of a strong executive, and that executive Catholic. France, therefore, in this period of settlement, became an absolute monarchy whose chief possessed tremendous and immediate powers, and a monarchy which incorporated with itself all the great elements of the national traditions, including the Church. It is the name of Louis Fourteenth, of course, which symbolizes this great time. His very long reign precisely corresponds to it. He was born, coincidentally, with that universal struggle for a religious settlement in Europe, which I have described as characteristic of the time. He died precisely at its close, and under him it seemed as though the reconstructed power of Gaul and the defense of organized Catholicism were to be synonymous. But there were two elements of disruption in that homogeneous body, which Louis the Fourteenth apparently commanded. The very fact that the Church had thus become in France an unshakable national institution chilled the vital source of Catholicism. Not only did the hierarchy stand in perpetual suspicion of the Roman See, and toy with the conception of national independence, but they and all the official organization of French Catholicism put the security of the national establishment and its intimate attachment to the general political structure of the state far beyond the sanctity of Catholic dogma or the practice of Catholic morals. That political structure, the French monarchy, seemed to be of granite and eternal. Had it indeed survived, the church in Gaul would be doubtless, in spite of its attachment to so mundane a thing as the crown, have still survived to enjoy one of those resurrections which have never failed it in the past, and would have returned by some creative reaction to its principle of life. But for the moment, the consequence of this fixed political establishment was that skepticism and all those other active forces of the mind which play upon religion in any Catholic state had full opportunity. The Church was, so to speak, not concerned to defend itself, but only its method of existence. It was as though a garrison, forgetting the main defenses of a place, had concentrated all its effort upon the security of one work which contained its supplies of food. Wit, good verse, sincere enthusiasm, 
a lucid exposition of whatever in the human mind perpetually rebels against transcendental affirmations were allowed every latitude and provoked no effective reply but overt acts of disrespect to ecclesiastical authority were punished with rigor the end of section thirty two